Okay, my name is Boris Kolpakov. Um, topic of my to my presentation today is the design of a new C++ build tool chain. A couple of words about uh, myself. I work at Code Synthesis, where we develop open source tools and libraries. Some more notable ones are ODB and XSD. ODB is an ORM for C++. XSD is an XML schema compiler, also for C++. We inside Code Synthesis we use our own. A uh, new make based build system called Build. Been using it for about 11 years now, but a couple of years ago we kind of realized you know, it's, it's a dead end. Uh, new make just wasn't designed for what we need to handle these days. So we decided to build our own and it kind of morphed into a tool chain rather than a build tool or build system. And I'll explain in a bit what I mean by the tool chain. Last year I gave a presentation. Uh, that was called New Build System for New C++. How many of you were there? Okay, about half of you. Cool. Well, that one was just about the build system because that's all that was ready at the time. And a lot has changed since then. So the build system itself uh, saw a lot of improvements. So in fact, I would say bulk of the development went into the build system. But we now have a package manager. We have a repository web interface. And we also started what we hope will become the repository of open source C++ packages one day, hopefully. Here we start. So kind of the topic of today's presentation is are the three key areas that we have to solve and, f and fix, uh, primarily in the build system. And before we dive into that, um, let's see what we're actually trying to achieve here. You know, if there are a lot of build systems these days. And you go to the website or read the readme, and they say they are better than everything else. So what exactly is better? So we'll talk quickly about what we're actually trying to achieve here. Our, and I mean, it might not be what you want to achieve, but that's what we want to achieve. <laughs> um, so the primary goal is a uniform uh, build interface across all the pla platforms and compilers. So you can see we want to have exactly the same look and fields minus you know, directory separators on, for example, Unix or Linux and Windows. Second goal is ready out of the box, even on Windows, no Python. You know, we don't want to ask the user to install Python or MinGV or Sigwin or you would, you know, Ubuntu user land, the latest thing on Windows. We also want to handle development and distribution. Those two kind of pull the design in different directions. For development, you want a flexible, powerful build system. You don't quite care about you know portability that much as long as it handles your you know preferred environment. Well, for distribution, the end user just wants the simplest thing that does the job and gets out of the way. You know, he doesn't want to install Python. We want reliable builds. You know, oftentimes you find yourself, or well, I find myself uh, upgrading something, maybe some packages, maybe changing some options. And the build system says everything is up to date, and I don't quite trust it. So I just do my make clean and make just to make sure. And I mean, that's a waste of time, so I want to fix that. I want to handle cross compilation. I believe that cross compilation is nothing special. You know, it should be the norm, but quite a lot of build systems leave it as an afterthought and then, you know, struggle. So the good test, if you're designing your own build system, good test is ask yourself, is it easier to cross compile to Windows or to build natively? If the answer is no, then you're doing something wrong. Uh, we also want to handle some um, C++ specific kind of um, C slash C++ specific use cases. A good example would be generated source code and most precisely generated headers in the face of automatic dependency extraction. Here, the dependency extraction. We'll talk about it in a bit. We also don't want a black box build system. A lot of them these days are uh, basically documentation says, oh, you, if you want this, go stick that. And they don't even say what that exactly means in there, and you will get your result. You know, we, we, want, we want to have a, uh, a mental, you know, a conceptual model how things are built underneath that is not hidden from the user. And the idea is that you, know, you, want, you may want to use it to build something else entirely. Finally, we would like to have a sane syntax. And while at it, we might as well fix it. We don't want a, an any file or a bunch of variable assignments or some extension for some scripting language. OK, quick overview. I mentioned it's a tool chain, not a tool, because there are several of them. So we have the build system driver called B. So we decided to go ahead and name it B because I personally feel that make is too long to type. <laughs> and um, there is the package manager called BPKG. 
uh, we have a repository web interface, which is uh, basically what shows you things on the web. And we'll see now in a second how it looks. It's an Apache module, also written in C++. And we have CPP get, which is the uh, public repository of open source packages, which we hope will become one. Currently not very full. Uh, open source MIT license written in C++ 11, well, actually in C++ 14. There's just some features that are too hard to leave without. Uh, the minimum requirements are GC 4.8, Clang 3.4. Uh, also planning to support Visual Studio, probably. To, uh, definitely it will be at least 2015 and might be even update too. So haven't gotten there yet. Self-hosted, self-packaged, so the build system builds itself. Uh, it, package manager is packaged itself. And yeah, the, the packages are available on cppget.org. Uh, uh, current releases tested on Linux, Mac OS, FreeBSD, and Windows is coming probably in a version or two. So I was <laughs> challenged. <laughs> OK, some, let's see some examples. So we'll start from kind of the highest level and go down all the way to the build system. And you know, nothing can be higher level than browsing some web pages, right? So this is cppget.org. So it runs that BREP, the repository web interface. So something that you would expect from uh, you know, a listing of packages, right? If you go to the front page, it shows you all the packages, or the you know, first 10 of them. And you can search for packages. It gives you kind of a brief uh, summary, name, you know, license, how many dependencies. Uh, if you go, let's say this is BPKG, so it's the package manager. If we go and see uh, what's inside, so it gives you a little bit more information about the package. And then you see a list of versions. So unlike, say, binary uh, report, package reports like Debian or Red Hat, we actually have several versions in there. You can see they can be in different sections of the repository. So this is all in alpha. And if you actually go and check the version out, if the internet will work, um, then you will see some more information about the package. Ah, yes, question? What is the difference between depends and requires? We're actually going to get to that. Uh, a, a little bit. Well, the question was, what is the difference between depends and requires? And I'm answering this in later. So if you can just hold on. Now this is not good. This is going to be painful. Okay. So yeah, a bit more, even more information. You know, download URL in case you want to grab it yourself. Uh, more interesting stuff is this depends and requires, about which I'll. Do explain later and there's a piece of change log for you if you want to check it out. So nothing really surprising in there. Now we could have used the build system as an example. You know, it's packaged and built itself as an example of itself. Uh, it's going to take a bit of time because we have to first bootstrap it to use it. So we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to use the customary hello example. So in, for, for it, you know, we use it in our documentation in the introduction. So we actually run a special hello world repository for it, where just those packages leave, which is quite nice. You know, if you have 100 packages to weed through at a later stage, hopefully. We don't want to do that in, at the introductory stage. So we have this. It leaves here. Try this rather. OK, so same look, more or less, just different packages. You can see there's a hello example and some other libraries just to get them for illustration purposes. Uh, so let's now see a, a workflow from a, from a user's perspective will be. So let's say we woke up today and we realized we, we are in the mood for a hello program. So we go to the repository and we uh, just search for it, right? Um, so sometimes you would get several packages, presumably, that implement this. If you're, for example, searching for a library, so we'll check, you know, do I like a license? Is it GPL, MIT? You know, I don't like GPL. Or you check the number of dependencies. You know, if one has 10, the other one has one, and you don't like to have a lot of dependencies, then choose one. 
well, here the decision was made for us, so we'll just go and check it out. Again, you know, then you'll check the version. You'll see, you know, some are unstable, like we'll see later. Some are in testing. Again, here we got uh, decided. It got decided for us just one version. So let's say we like it and we decide, okay, we want to build it. Um, so let's see how we do that. So then now we will switch to package manager. First step in using the package manager, you actually need to create a, a configuration. And a configuration is just a directory where you build packages uh, with a similar settings, you know, Clang, GCC, debug release, 32-bit, 64-bit, you know, different day of the week, which, whichever you feel like. Um, so what do you feel like building it? GCC, Clang, debug release. GCC. Okay, let's do GCC 5 release. Sounds good. So the first thing is we create the, the directory. Right? We'll name it appropriately so that, you know, tomorrow if we build Clang, a debug, we will name it something different. So I'm going to just kind of get it from history. And I'll explain what's going on here. So bpkg is the package manager, create is the command for creating the configuration. This uh, CXX is a module, a build system module, which implements building C++. For now, that's all I'm going to say about it, but we'll see how it all fits together. And then you have two configuration variables. First specifies the compiler, and then you have an optimization options. What happens if you don't supply any options? It'll just build default. So it'll fix something? Yeah. Okay. It'll just plain GCC non-optimized. This is kind of still at the, we're kind of getting the lowest level stuff where you can specify everything precisely. There'll be a mechanism later to kind of just specify, you know, GCC release. We call it a config initializer. So it's kind of a more vague list of keywords that you just specify and the build system figures out what to use exactly from that. So that would include things like end of yeah, or like you'll say GCC 32-bit debug static. And I'll just do it for this platform. Okay, so running that set, created configuration. Um, so if we take a look at it, you know, most package managers will say, you know, never look inside. We say, hey, go ahead, look inside and maybe even hack inside. Um, so, you know, not too much stuff, some housekeeping information you can see. So looks something, looks like we are using SQLite to store some package information. And what there is, we'll talk about in a bit. So, okay, we have a configuration, so now we grab a package. We figured out what the package is. So to get the package, you need a repository, and a repository is either a local file system path or an, a URL. So if we go to the repository web interface, you know, where we have the version, one of the f uh, pieces of the information is actually location of this package. In other words, which repository it's in. So here it is. So I'm just going <coughs> to copy it. <coughs> so the next step, so we found the, where the, our package is. So we need to add this repository to the configuration. So we do it with a add command, not surprisingly. OK, I said I added the repository. So no, normally, if you have several package uh, repositories that you want to use, you'll keep adding them here. Once you're done with that, you do fetch, which fetches the list of packages. Now, uh, it says that the repository is unsigned, and do I want to continue? Now, I'm running a, a development uh, version of, of this thing, so some things are still not in the release, so you won't see the, the signing part. So it's coming in the next version. I'm talk, I'll talk about signing in a bit at the end, towards the end of the talk. So let's say yes. So it said it fetched three packages in one repository. Another useful uh, command is status, which gives you the information about the status of any package in this repository. So let's see what it says about hello. So it says this version is available. Well, without kind of further delay, let's just build it. Build is probably the most interesting uh, command in the package manager, right? So what it does, it goes ahead and figures out everything that you need, that it actually needs to do in order to build you what you asked it to build, and then it uh, presents you a plan of action and asks you to confirm. You can always kind of auto confirm it with a command line uh, option. So we 
looks good, right? So it needs leap hello. And we're going to go ahead and build it. So fetched, unpacked, configured, built. Stuff that you would expect. Right? Nothing overly surprising. Yes, question? So fetch didn't actually fetch. Because fetch is, so fetch only downloaded the meta information about the packages, but the build process itself fetches the sources. Ah, uh, correct. Okay. Yeah. Fetch basically got the list of packages available in all the repositories that were added, mm -hmm. uh, that you've added to the configuration. Okay. <coughs> Let me just. No, Is there a way to skip fetch and just have it do it with a build? It's kind of going to be, uh, the question is, can't we just kind of imply fetch on every build? So basically refetch the information. I suppose you could do that. It's just extra download. You know, every time you build, you actually need to go and fetch that stuff. And yeah, and you know, you, you can have, for example, 10 repositories. So you actually have to download 10 things. And those things are actually not, might not be a one file. But, I mean, it's pretty similar, for example, to uh, apt get the way the same works. OK, I'm going to, uh, just to sh illustrate, we're going to use the clean command. And we're going to clean this package. So clean means you know delete all the build system output. If you want to actually get rid of the package, you use drop. Um, I just want to re re rebuild it with verbose mode so that we can see that we're actually using GCC5. and and optimization. So for that, I'm using the update command. Oh, yeah. So, so running in verbose. So you actually see the command lines that are being executed. So I can see we're using GC5 and optimization. So, so I took a look at our configuration again. No, we didn't do it later. Let's go back to our repository. So we saw that a lot depends on lib hello. So let's go take a look at libhello, and maybe it's, there's some, something more interesting going on. Well, here we have a few versions. And you can see some of them are in testing, some of them in stable. Remember, we added the stable repository, so we got the stable version. You can see in, in testing, there's some action. You know, there's now two dependencies for this library, so maybe some cool functionality. So we want to go and check it out. So let's upgrade libhello to the newer version. And again, you know, the same process. Uh, we realize it's in a different repository. So we'll go ahead and add this repository to our configuration. Uh, fetch. You type stable, not. Mystery. Okay, so fetch two repositories, a few more packages. Let's see what's the status of the hello is. Okay, we, we have a, one configured in our configuration, that version that we built. And we have a couple of more versions available. So we'll just go and, up and build it. So you can upgrade, downgrade stuff via build as well. There's no separate upgrade, downgrade command. Okay, so again, plan of action. Now it has two dependencies. And we also need to reconfigure hello. Does it make sense? Why do we need to reconfigure hello? Is it kind of obvious to everyone, right? Okay, perfect. So um, just did you do something specific to make it want to use this live hello, or is it only because it's a newer, newer version? Yeah, by default. If you don't specify the version, we'll see how we specify the version. Oh, the question is, did I do anything special to make sure it's the la latest version? And the answer is, um, if you don't specify a version explicitly, it just gets the latest that is available, builds the latest. So this seems like um, this seems a, a, a little dicey because it's it's pretty common that you might want to say, I really want stable configurations, but. Mm but I need the testing version of this thing so that I can work on it. And I don't want all of my all other my things packages to upgrade to the latest testing version. Um, so the comment is that, 
Uh, let me just try to phrase it. I, I, I think what you're suggesting is that it's actually going to go ahead and upgrade everything else to 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 to, uh, to well, testing. In that testing no, it'll only upgrade what you actually asked it to. So it's not actually upgrading hello. Where was the where was the request to upgrade? Um, here it is. It's built yeah, lib hello. Project. You see, if I if I said bpkg build lib hello and hello, and there was hello in testing, then it would have gone and and, and upgraded for you. What if you now say? Yeah, that's. Yeah. Hmm? So that's what I'm talking about. So a lot of, of new build systems. I don't know how the Swift build system does it, hmm? but the Rust build system actually, when it once builds a package, it writes a log file that says you're currently using this version and it, you need to explicitly tell it now I want to update my versions to make it change that otherwise it will keep using that version let me just so get, get what we did here right we had the, the lib hello as an implicit dependency mm -hmm. now we have added it explicitly mm -hmm. so where which line added it explicitly what the, okay the, can, can, the you, can you cancel that that added a repository sure. what, what happens repository if you write all kinds package of software, build right? hello just right, build hello it. It's a direct path of this. This is fun. Okay, maybe I don't understand what a repository is. Is a repository a thing for one package or for many packages? Many packages. Okay, so to me, what it looks like is you added a repository mm -hmm. that might contain many other things, and there's no targeted way to say, to say, look, I just want to, I, you know, out of everything in the repository mm. that might have been that might have a newer version. Mm. I just want the newer version of this thing. Yeah. I, I, uh, I think that kind of, and I'm getting to that. The point is, the PPKG actually never, you know, it, it's, it's very lazy. You know, if, if you don't ask it to do something specifically and, it's, and, and there's no need for it, it's not going to do it. Like in this example, we're upgrading leap hello. Let's, ho let's say there was a, an upgraded version of hello as well in the testing repository. Mm -hmm. It's not going to do it. You didn't ask it to do it. It's not going to do it. So probably your, your concern is, let's say libhello depended on another library that I had built from the stable repository. And now it's, it gets upgraded, right? Which is which something that I don't want. So that, that's kind of a plausible scenario. Again, you know, BPKG is not going to upgrade it if it already satisfies the requirements of libhello. Well, what is a bit puzzling is the word build for it yeah. because it does more but well names are difficult mm. so I guess that by changing the command names a bit something like with fetch I now realize that would be the up get update because well with opt we mm. sort of learned a language <coughs> for the different operations perhaps yeah. maybe that might be something to look into so the comment was that perhaps naming is a bit off and built is a bit confusing because it's actually doing an upgrade. Right. Good so, point. so to be consistent with Dave's point, right? Um, BKG build lib hello should build the current version, but upgrade lib hello should bring it up to the next version. But you see, there is update. If you want to build what you already have, you have an update yeah, command, and it's kind of yeah. consistent, consistent with the build system because the build system also has the update operation. Okay. Yes, question. Sorry, it's been a while. <laughs> if, you out, if the testing repository had a version of libhello that was too new for the Hello application, mm -hmm. is, is VPKG smart enough to say, this new version is too new? I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use the old one. Well, it will. Let me think what it will actually do. I think it will tell you that it needs to. If, if, if there is a, a newer version of hello that, that it can upgrade to and kind of satisfy everyone, then it will offer you to do that. But again, you know, you can say, I don't like it. So the comment was, what if uh, leap hello was, you know, too new and a hello kind of was incompatible with it? And so the answer is depends whether there is a compatible version available. If there is, it will offer it to upgrade. If there isn't, it will just say, you know, I cannot, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible. But let, let me show you the next bit, and maybe it, it will make a little bit of more sense. Um, so we're going ahead and upgrading this thing. Okay. So the other thing it does, so I think that reconfigure hello kind of obvious to everyone. 
and we didn't have it initially. It's actually something I added just a couple of days ago. So normally it would reconfigure it and leave it, you know, there for you. It's probably up to, uh, out of date. So now we're actually offering you to update all the dependent packages. So basically, if there are packages in your configuration that depend on lib hello, we kind of reconfigure them by, by default because we must do that. And we also add, offer you to update them. We might not want to do it, but let's do it here. So again, a bit of similar things. Fetch the dependent packages, build everything, and there we see updated lib hello. Okay, so this is the part where I want to show you that maybe will make a bit more sense. Let's say we don't like this. You know, we examine the sleep hello. It doesn't give any new functions. It just add dependencies. We don't like this kind of stuff. So we're going to go and downgrade it back to the stable version. So this is how we do it. So by default, build will, will get the latest version, but you can also specify the exact version. So going back to that question, what happens if, if there is a newer version that libhello depends on, you can always kind of override or resolve this manually. Let's say libhello pulls something from testing that you don't want actually. Let's say you only want libhello from testing. All other uh, dependencies that, are, that libhello has must have come from stable. Well, there's no kind of a magic option to specify it. But you can always, you know, you will run update libhello. It will list you the list of libraries that you need. And you, do, and you go ahead, you say no, you know, you, I don't want to build it. And then you go ahead and you specify exact versions of, of, of the prerequisite libraries that you wanted to use. I mean, kind of low level, I agree. Maybe there's a better way. So early days still. Yes, question. So I get the sense that there's, there's a kind of an implicit model behind this that you haven't quite told us about. Mm. And, and I'm guessing, but I, I want to know what it is. I'm guessing that it's like, um, in this directory you created, where you're doing all of this, you're, you, you are setting up a, a uh, collection of different interdependent packages, and they all, they all have to be compatible because you're going to, because in that directory anything you build is going to use those, those dependencies, and presumably if you had created another directory to work on, you could do a completely different configuration. Correct. The same compiler and everything. Correct. Different versions. OK. That's going to be um, hard. <laughs> okay. But we are going to get to what exactly happens there, how the packages connect to each other. I hope it will make sense, because it's all done by the build system, actually. Yeah. And the Question. build command really means select package and build it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a little bit more complicated. It's kind of. You know, well, the question is build command means select the package and build it. But it depends in which stage the package is. Uh, they are, it kind of, if you dive it into a lower level, you, you know, for example, you might have a package that is fetched, unpacked, and it's still not configured and still not built, not updated. So what build does is basically kind of picks up where the package is left off, which it can be that it's not there at all, which means that fetch and, and install. And then it just goes ahead and gets it to the updated state. It's resolved about, dependencies and builds. How yeah. about calling it activate? Activate. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would, I would think you mm. select. Yeah. Use. Well, then afterwards you can use it for the yeah. downloads or builds. I don't care. All right, so we are downgrading this thing. <coughs> and again, uh, says downgrade, reconfigure. It all looks good. Um, yeah, let's update hello as well. And um, so it did that. So another cool thing that it does, it actually detects that now that we've downgraded, we don't have those dependencies. Lib hello doesn't depend on those two uh, format, lib format, and lib print. So PPKG de detects that, that those are were automatically installed and no longer used. So it offers you to drop them, which is kind of a good idea to keep your stuff nice and clean. OK, I'm sorry. You need to you need to change the verb disfigured. That Why? doesn't mean what you think it means. That isn't <laughs> oh, oh yeah. That that really means something else. It, it was funny though. <laughs> yeah, was. Maybe. I guess I'll have to look it up. It's not the opposite of configured. Is it? Okay. What suggestions? <coughs> Deconfigured. Deconfigured. Okay, maybe. That will be a lot of grip, you know, or said. <laughs> 
Okay, so um, yeah, nothing surprising. Kind of drop that stuff and rebuild it. So what exactly makes a package? Well, there are two requirements. First, it has to use the build system, right? Kind of big one. And the other one is small. It just needs to provide a manifest file. And we take a look at, at the manifest. Um, things that you would expect, right? Name, version, uh, description, license. Kind of looks a little bit like a Debian control file with a little bit of improvements. I'm not going to go into too, de too much detail because if you, know, if you start discussing what version exactly means, then you can spend uh, 90 minutes easily. Okay. So the point is, if you're already using uh, the build system, converting a project to a package is, is actually fairly easy, easy thing to do. OK, everyone happy? So what's a project? A project is that directory that you made, or? Uh, no, that well, we'll get to it right okay. now. So kind of the idea is that uh, what, what you build with a build system is a project. What you package, then you, you can take this project, add the manifest file, you know, package it, and it becomes a package. So, okay, so that's the manifest. So we've, we've looked at the VPKG. If you want to see, uh, there, there are probably about 15 commands currently that implements the core. Uh, you can go and run bpkg help and it will show you all that stuff. Um, there's some lower level ones. So if you're curious, you can go and take a look at it. Okay. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Cool. Okay, so th that's the package manager. So now we're going to uh, kind of step further, deeper. And we'll talk about the build system. So this was kind of perspective of an end user. Let's say you need lib hello. Uh, someone wrote a package that you go ahead and you got it, get it like that and you use it. So now let's say we are the actually the developer of that of those packages. You normally wouldn't use a uh, package manager for kind of everyday development. You don't want stuff to get fetched, unpacked. You you might use it for testing. For example, you might have a local package repository that, and then you have 20 configurations that you can automatically build from that location. But for every development, you know, like change and update cycle, you will use the build system directly. So I have the two of them set up here. So L is my alias for list and T is for tree. So we have these two packages. So I'll just go ahead and take a look at what's inside. So these are projects, you know, to answer your question. Um, and let's take a look. Manifest we already looked at. Um, hello, CXX, I'm, I'm not gonna even show what's in there. I'm sure most of you can figure out what's in there. Uh, let's take, so there is the other three files are the build system files. So let's take a look at the root one. Okay, two lines. First one is an import directive. Again, we'll talk about import in a bit. Uh, the idea is basically the build system has an import mechanism and we depend on lib hello, so we need to get it somehow. So that's how we do it. Next line looks. Uh, hmm? What's all that syntax? Yeah, it's all new. So it's uh, uh, so the question is what's that syntax and I'm kind of give you giving you an idea what it looks like, but as we go along, I'm going to explain what what all those things like you're probably looking at this curly braces like what the hell is going on, right? I'm looking at the assignment because you said before there will be no assignments. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I said that it's not going to be just variable assignments. I mean, yeah. All right, that second line is, but yeah, good point. I guess I must be more precise huh, with this crowd. Um, the second line, if you, if you kind of forget about the curly braces and other stuff, it looks pretty much like make dependency declaration, right? We have a target on the left, which is an executable, source files on the right, and then we have the library that we just imported. So, okay, so, the, so the first hello is the name of the, uh, of the output executable. Yeah. The second hello is the name of the source file. So yeah, we'll get to that curly braces and that things before them, you know, next step basically. Now the question is, um, so this is this basically means that you know on the left hand side we have an executable name and on the right hand side we have a source file name. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at the other two files. Um, they are basically project wide settings. They are split into two files, and the reason for that I'm not going to go into. Um, so bootstrap is loaded first, as the name suggests. So let's take a look at it. 
uh, three lines. The first one specifies the project name. So in, in build two, you know, we, we kind of say, okay, they, they, they got to be a project name. You know, that's how we, that's what we used in import, for example. So, you know, non-optional required thing. Then we have two using directives, which is basically a way to say, you know, I want to use this build system module. So we have the config module, which implements the configuration uh, part, and we have install module, which implements the installation of your things. Again, we'll look at all of that in a second. So the second file is root uh, file. Again, another using directive. Again, they, you know why they are split like that? It, it's there are reasons for that, but I kind of deep in, in there that I'm not going to into in detail. So another using directive, like for example, why why can't we specify using directive in the Bootstrap for for the C++ module? There is a reason for that, but it'll probably take about 20 minutes to explain. So uh, CXX this implements building C++. This, by the way, the same um, name that we saw in the bpkg create command. So hopefully things maybe start to connect a little bit. Then we specify the extension for the uh, for our source C++ source files in the in our project. Again, not going to go into the syntax details too much. Please don't ask questions <laughs> 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 about that. Okay. So what does it mean to set the C++ standard to 11? It means that it will pass. Oh, the question is what what does it mean? Well, first of all, I'm glad you didn't ask about that syntax on top. So. Thanks for that. You're, um, you're, really, you're really asking us to ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You really yeah. don't want me to ask? At the end? Okay. okay. So it means, uh, you know, it's, it's compiler specific, right? So the question is, what does it exactly mean to say, you know, I want C++ Elian st a standard? It means that it will try to figure out what, which option to pass to, to make the compiler so turn into C++. Have, Requires C++ 11, <coughs> and another one that requires C++ 14. Do they conflict? Um, not sure exactly if it is right now, but there is a way. Oh, the question is, if, if I have one target that requires C++ 11 and the other target that requires C++ 14, I think ra right now you'll have a project that will have to use kind of a, a consistent standard, though it's not something that cannot be done. Um, it, it can, there is a way to do it. So basically the idea is that you will specify this standard not, you know, in your, in your build file like that in this current scope. You will actually specify it for a target. So you will say executable hello colon CXX standard 11. Because in, in CMake there was this decision that setting a standard makes no sense because it doesn't mean anything. What you should specify is what language features you require and then CMake will figure out what compileflex is necessary for that language feature, if it's mm. perhaps well, you kind of still have the same problem. How do you specify it for different targets? So the comment was that in CMake, for example, you, you don't specify a standard; we just specify which features you want. Perhaps this is kind of the next step to 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 do it. <coughs> that, has, that has some real downsides too. Yeah. I mean, it means that it means that you can't. There's no way to say, look, I standardized this project is allowed to use anything in C++ 11. It's not the ones mm. we're currently using. It's like, this is how we're going to develop it. And yeah. we don't have a, a simple name for that. Yeah. And also, when, when you asked the question, I thought your use case was, well, I have this library and I need, <coughs> I need it to compile in both C++ 11 and 98 because my users are asked for this. So some of my test cases compile as C++ 98 and some compile as C++ 11. And I, mean, I want them both in, in the same project. But that, then it makes a difference whether I specify features or a standard version. But right. Compiling in C11 or 98 really applies only to GCC and Clans. Yes. Right? Microsoft Studio compiler doesn't have to be sync. Well, one interesting thing about Visual Studio actually just kind of was thinking about it the other day. Oh, so look, I don't think I'm going to be able to kind of repeat all the discussion here. So I'll just maybe some kind of interesting comments I'll, I'll repeat, or, you know, kind of specific questions. Um, so for Visual Studio, you don't specify the standard. So what we did, actually, if you ask for C++11, you'll actually check that you're not using, for example, Visual Studio 2013, which doesn't have C++11, right? So, which I think is, is, is a useful thing to do. Maybe not. All right.
<coughs> uh, what's that? So we took a look at our project. Again, I'm, I'm just trying to give you an idea, you know, what it looks like, and we'll see some details later. Start to build it. So I m mentioned that the build system driver is called B. Uh, we try, we just run it customarily. If you just run it without any specifying any operational command, it just updates. So we got an error, you know, unable to import target, some suggestion. The last three lines is what you will see quite a bit uh, in build. And that's basically a stack, kind of a stack trace of how we got there, which can be quite useful in debugging. Um, so we'll get back to it. So it's, it says, you know, it needs lib hello, and we kind of didn't specify where our lib hello is. So maybe let's go and build that, and then we come back and uh, take a look at, at, um, at fixing that. So this is the lib hello project. A little bit pretty similar, but a little bit more complicated. Uh, now we have a sources that are in the subdirectory. So the only file I'm going to show is the build fi uh, the file that builds the library. Hmm. Build file is not in the build subdirectory. It's on the top level. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's in hello subdirectory. Coffee is appearing now. <laughs> okay, so first line similar to the hello example, just building a library instead of an executable. Then a couple of variable assignments, not going to go into detail. And then we configure where we install things. Okay, I mean cryptic, but you know, my my, my goal is to show you that it's not a a black box first of all, and it's not you know. A five pages of, of make file or whatever you have to build a simple library. Because with an old build system, that would be five pages of the make file, you know, to make sure it builds everywhere and supports stuff. Okay. Let's try to build it. All seems to work. We now look, <coughs> look in there. We have a archive and shared library in there built. And by default, it builds both, but you can set which one you want. Okay. So let's go try to fix our hello example. So that's what the error we got. And the suggestion was we use this configuration variable to specify where our uh, stuff is, right? So that's what we're going to try. I'm going to just give it the directory and hope for the best. Okay, it actually worked. There's our executable. Seems to work, right? Okay, I'm quite behind, so I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. So let's say we change something and, and then we try to build again. So if we run just without any arguments, we're going to get the same error, which is not going to be very in fun during development. So the reason for that is that we are running in what we call a transient configuration. So basically, the build system kind of configures itself based on the command line uh, variables and then does what, it, what you asked it to do and then kind of discards it. So to fix that, we actually need to configure it. And all we do is run the configure command and saves the build file. Uh, said uh, saved something, so we'll go and take a look at it. So this is a, a build file. Uh, the comment says that it was automatically created by that config module, but you're free to edit it. So we actually kind of try to make sure that you can edit it in your favorite editor. Well, the only notable thing in here is really this variable that we now save from the conf command line. So now if we run uh, just B, it all works. Okay. I'm going to explain what those, that hairy looking output is about. The other thing co fairly common that you might want to do is build like out of three, uh, make out of three builds. And that's useful if you want to test several compilers and so on. So let's see how that works. So we'll build Clang and GCC uh, versions. I'm, again, I'm going to spell it all out a bit. 
first and explain what it all means. Okay. So config CXX, we already saw specified clang there. Import, already saw. So the only interesting part is really this configure thing. Well, we saw configure before. But what's inside is essentially, well, if you if you kind of intuitively read it, it basically says, you know, build me hello. The source files are in hello subdirectory at this output directory, which we called hello clang. Well, this one actually not going to work because we haven't built lib hello for yet. This one, yeah. Okay. Now we also, so now we just configure those things and we'll see how we build them. Okay. So now if you look at the, the list of directories with hello clang and leave hello clang, so now we can go ahead and build our hello clang. You can see builds with Clang as expected. Now I'm going to do the same for GCC. I'm kind of setting up uh, some, you know, build kind of structure so that I can show some more interesting features later. So I'm going to do the same for GCC, except I'm going to do it all in a single <coughs> invocation to look a little bit more complicated. Basically, the idea is that in, inside this configure operation, you can specify several projects that you want to configure is what we do. If we look inside now we have hello GCC and I leave hello GCC, right? We can for example step into hello GCC and we can build it. So that's how you would normally do development or how I do development. You know I have Clang, debug release builds and you know I go and check things out here and there. So I have several configurations of the same project sitting on my on my uh, workspace. Right, so th these are examples, took a lot longer than I expected, but that's kind of the core basic functionality of it. Um, so let's go talk about the curly braces. Um, so this is the build file from our hello example again. Th I'm going to use make as a kind of an example of the, or, or to, to explain the wrong decisions and how we fix them. And this would be the, the make file for our simple project, right? more or less, kind of. Looks kind of even better than our stuff, right? One, one line compared to two. See what happens if we actually need to build this on Windows. And on Windows, executables have extensions. So the way you fix it is something like that. Right? All of a sudden, it doesn't look very nice. Uh, uh, the, 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 the lack of a dot days drives me nuts, personally. <laughs> So what we decided to do in B, and, and, and this gets worse, right? Uh, sometimes, so in Make, basically, whatever you specify, you know, the, the, the name that you specify is taken literally to mean a file name. And sometimes it's not one file. For example, on Windows, you have a, a for, for a shared library, you have a DLL and import stuff, right? It's two, actually, things. So what we did in build two is we kind of abstracted it away. We said, you know, what, what the target name is actually not a file something more, a little bit more abstract. And what it has is, as a type. So those lib executable. So make, make kind of, the, the way to deduce a type of, of a file in make is to use extensions. Well, there's, for example, no extension for executable on, on POSIX systems. So that, that, that gives a lot of pain. And so to solve it, we said, you know, there's always an explicit target type. You know, it might not be a file. It might not be several files. It might be several files. So we have type, and then we, it can also be optionally project qualified. So we can say, you know, this name is actually, by default, the name will kind of assume that it's in, in the project that you are in. But you can also say the name is, is in some other project. So hopefully now this makes a little bit more sense. We have a project qualified name, type is hello, and the kind of the name itself is hello, executable, source file. Question? So I understand why you want to do that for the files that you're generating, but for the source files that you have in your directory, uh, they have a fixed name that you know definitely, and you don't want to find anything else. So why do you do that for the source files as well? 
Uh, well, the question is why do we do it for the source files? Because we know the file names exactly. It's just consistent. You know, we have a single way to do it. And I'll, I'll, exp I'll show how the source files actually searched. Plus, plus the source files might be, you know, you don't want to specify exactly, okay, this is definitely a source file, right? It's kind of an extra stuff. Source files can also be generated. Question? So we have a hello.cpp and a hello.c. Mm -hmm. so. so you will have this. Here you will say C. We will remove the two X's. Well, the question is if, you have, if I have hello CP, uh, C++ source file and C source file, well, the ta target type will be C instead of CXX. You can also, if, you, if you're so inclined, you can always specify the extension explicitly. Just short it to, to, to kind of to type. Okay, so this is an example of, of, of an actual fragment from a real build file. So it's libutl, it's a build utility library that we use. So we kind of added a little bit of a name generation syntax. Uh, I don't know, might look weird, but yeah. Well, the, the idea is basically, oftentimes you have several files for the same source name. So normally you would say, you know, I have base64, here the file, source file, include file, and template file. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So th these are the curly braces. Hopefully, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, now, next problem again: our little make file. Uh, make was actually designed for building things like that, right? It's it's Unix-only, non-naming variation. You know, as soon as you have ex different extensions, different set of files, trouble start. Simple utilities, no subdirectories, uh, no support for different building out of source out of source. So this kind of simple requirements I mean, it was about 30 years ago. Um, they led kind of some decisions that are really painful now. And the first one is, you know, all relative paths in make are actually relative to a current working directory. When you have a make file like that, it's fine, right? It's, 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 there's only one directory. When you have several make files that kind of pulling different parts of a project or even several sub projects all in one, you know, you start kind of getting you know, targets in the places where you don't expect. There's no SRC out distinction or support. You know, if you look at AutoMake, for example, the solution is basically to prefix all your targets and prerequisites with actual, you know, paths stored in variables. Doesn't look very pretty. Then we have global variables. Uh, this kind of makes, compo you know, using independent projects in Make really painful. Because you, you just don't know who will overwrite whom at, at what point and you know what, what the end goal will be. Okay, so let's see how we fixed all of that in build two. That's probably the kind of the most radical departure from a make model. So probably the easiest to explain it uh, by example. So remember we configured this out of three build for our lib hello. So we call it lib hello GCC. So inside those directories they actually have exactly the same structure. So they kind of run in parallel. So we have a hello subdirectory and we have a hello subdirectory here. So what we do is we say, you know, we, we, we are going to have a scope, you know, nested scopes that kind of track these subdirectories. So the easiest way is to maybe show it as, a, as this representation. So I use this curly braces kind of nesting to show nested scopes. We didn't call it just a, a, a directory, we called it a scope because it actually tracks two directories. It, it tracks the source directory and output directory. So I use this little add syntax to represent that. And that add syntax is not accidental. We've seen it already uh, when we ran configure. Remember, we specified two, two paths. OK, so now if we add the target, the lib hello target, that's where it will end up. I think everyone kind of expected that. And going back to that question, how does the source file search? Um, so in make, every things that you have on the left-hand side and right-hand side of the colon is, is the same thing, it's called a target, it's searched in the same way. Uh, and this, this causes problems because, uh, you know, if you have two different directories, you have source directory, output directory, how do you make sure that your sources come from the source directory? And they invented this vpath, a uh, little clutch that is really painful to use. So in build2 we decide, no, in, in, it's not going to be the same thing. So on the left-hand side, we still have a target. It always goes into the output directory. On the right-hand side, we have uh, a th what we call a prerequisite. It's a different kind of object. But um, 
it's resolved to a target. And the way it's done is basically in two steps, a little bit simplifying here. First, we check if we have an, uh, a target in the output directory with this name and type. If we do have it, you know, then that's, that's what's used. So this kind of covers generated source files and headers. Otherwise, this prerequisite is searched for in the, uh, in the source directory. So, you know, we don't have, it's kind of all fits. Okay, if, we, if I now add the variables into this scoping, whole scoping machinery, uh, then I guess you also can guess where it all goes. So these two variables are set by the build system, so it kind of tracks, uh, gives you access to them, so that they're quite useful to in the uh, specifying include search, so which is what we do here in our build file. So we specify that you know, we include all our files from the root of the project, and I guess also I assume everyone can guess how the lockup happens the same, right? We search in this scope, if not found, search in the outer scope. So with, the, with this kind of change in the, in the model a little bit of the make, uh, we kind of solved all those problems. So now projects don't step on each other's, you know, variables because we don't have global variables anymore. They are all scoped. We also kind of, kind of have predictable uh, model where the targets end up being if we, if we specify them as a relative pass. So one cool uh, consequence of this is that you can now build completely unrelated projects or even multiple configurations of the same project with a single uh, build system in vacation. So remember we have this, uh, we configured two out of three builds. So I'm going to clean them. <coughs> So that we actually build. And then I'm just going to go ahead and specify both of them. Run verbose. So you can see I actually ran two different compilers in the same you know, invocation. I don't think you see that a lot. So I think, I don't know if, 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 if you can kind of feel where this, the major benefit of this comes. So when you when you do parallel builds, let's say you have a, you know different projects completely unrelated or several configurations of them, you know if you do it step by step, actually uh, kind of missing quite a bit like a, a long link time, for example, would be a good example. If you throw it all together, you actually get the best utilization of all your CPU resources. Okay. I think I'm gonna, s or maybe I'll just mention it quickly and briefly because <coughs> I have done, I'm really out of time. So the other thing that we kind of fixed in build two is ability to override variables um, nicely on the command line. So you, you can have an uh, outright override. So for example, you want to quickly build stuff with Clang instead of GCC in, in, in this particular configuration. So you can just override it and it will pick it up. Then we also added, uh, ability to kind of add a suffix to the value that is in the build file and we have a prefix <laughs> in the value. So the two kind of good examples for this is to add a debug option. So you want to rebuild your configuration quickly to, to in debug, for example, to exo examine a core file or you can override the include search path. So you want to add it at the beginning so it's searched first. Okay, I'm going to skip this example. If, if anyone is interested, you can ask me after the talk. Um, so this is actually a cool thing. Um, so in this example, uh, if we override the compiler, and I would show you an example if I had, I had time, what happens is build will actually build everything that is affected by it. And the question is how does it know uh, of that? And um, the reason this for this is this high fidelity builds. It's a kind of a, a feature that we have in build. So the idea is that, um, they are, they are out of build dependencies. Like the biggest example, kind of the example that you're most familiar with is probably, you know, extracted in header includes, um, include headers, and they are extracted with this uh, dash M option of the GC Clang, normally stored in a file by the build system, sometimes called the D, uh, sometimes something else called normally a DEP file. But if you think about it, that's not it, right? There's also the compiler. If you change the compiler, then obviously whatever we build is kind of out of date, and we can also upgrade the compiler. We can reconfigure compiler. We can change options, right? We can 
change debug level, I mean optimization level, add and remove, include search paths. Also some subtle changes, uh, more subtle changes. So the idea is that if the set of, of uh, sources changed, then actually, for example, a library and executable changed as well. A good example would be, let's say you have a library and executable in the same directory that you're building and you decide, okay, I'm gonna move um, a source file from a library to an ex or from an executable to a library, and you already have this object file up to date. Everything else is up to date in the in the directory. So most build build systems will actually miss it. The whole thing, everything is up to date. Okay, so what we do is uh, we're gonna say, okay, well we're gonna gen generalize this .d file and we'll call it an auxiliary dependency database. So now we we don't just store headers in there. We actually store values or uh, checksums in 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 different cases. Of, of the compiler, so we have a compiler checksum, we have an op we hash the options and we store them in there. And um, so, as well as the sort, as the actual input. Okay, we're not gonna examine this file. It looks fairly fine. Compiler checksum, compiler detection, cross compilation. Okay, maybe I'll show that. So I mentioned that cross compilation should be the same uh, there shouldn't be anything special. And we'll go take a look at that. So we have this Clang GCC build right there, and kind of native builds there for this architecture. Nothing prevents us from setting up a similar build for a cross compiler. Okay, the, the, the output kind of looks a bit hairy. So the idea is that I have a, a MinGV to Windows cross compiler here. And I can just use it. So again, specify the compiler, we'll say specify the lib tool here because it's funny enough if you forget and it uses the Linux one, it still works. Um, so we're building everything static here because I just want to run it and I want to mess with copying DLLs. And there is this exactly the same, you know, we just called the output di directories, hello mingv gcc and hello mingv, I mean lib hello mingv. Okay, so this actually, this output shows the compiler detection um, support in build. So we actually assign a compiler ID. So we have GC Clang, Apple Clang, MSVC. Then we extract the version nicely if you want to compare it. Uh, there's the compiler checksum. And the, the, the crucial part for the cross compilation support is actually detecting this target properly. And it can be quite hard. So for example, in build, what, what happens if you specify the dash m32, for example, option? You know, you change the the output to 32 bits. So build two actually handles it pretty well, and there's quite a bit of code to do that, and it's not fun, but someone has to do it. So we kind of configured everything, and if we look at that, we now have these two directories. We have hello mingv, and we have lib hello mingv. So I'm just going to go ahead and build. For both, yeah, that's good. You can see use the MinGV tool chain. We have an executable. <coughs> Yay. So as you can see, you know, there's not there's not really difference between setting up a native build or you know cross compilation build in build two. Question? Following a use case, um, I have a code generator. And, mm -hmm. I mean, I have the sources for the code generator. Um, I need to compile the generator, mm -hmm. then generate the source code, and then generate the, and compile the, these sources. Um, when I compile locally, there's no problem. When I when use when I use cross compilation, the code generator, of course, needs to be compiled for the host platform, mm -hmm. while the actual code needs to be compiled for the target platform. Well, you, you just saw how we compiled one with client. Well, the question is. Uh, well, the setup is basically you have a code generator that needs to be compiled for native platform, and then you run it, generate the code, and then you cross compile the result to a to a target. But you want that to be all part of the build process. Just yeah, exactly. Okay. So, and we saw you, you know you can run we we run Clang and GCC in the same build, so okay. there's nothing really interesting. You don't, have, you don't have the output of the of the GCC dependent on the output of the claim. You don't have, right, what he's talking about is a situation mm. where you have, where you have one build where there's a mm. dependency between 
Like you have to actually run the code generator as part of the build process yeah. for the for the second. Make sure you do that. Yeah. You okay, so you haven't exactly. So so the the, the 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 my my point is that um, we just saw an example where we built two configurations of the same project and we use different compilers. And in build two, you know, whether you use native compiler or a cross compiler, it doesn't matter, right? So imagine, imagine we have... Um, He's talking about one, one project that requires yeah. two different compilers to build it. Well, one project will be a bit... Uh, Tough right now, but if you can split them into two separate projects, you know, yeah, code, code generate. Always build the first one, install, and then build the second one. But I want um, when I, I when I change the source mm. code of the of the, um, of the code generator and then mm. build my final uh, target, mm. uh, the build system should detect yeah, that. Yeah, it, it will. The only thing you can you, you cannot do right now is you cannot have it in the same project. Because in, in, in a single project, you use a, a single compiler. But if you can split them into two projects and connect them via import, you can still, you still if you change the generate, I mean, import is not, is not a dumb thing that, you know, I'll just take whatever is there as is. It actually makes sure that what is there is up to date. So it will work exactly the same. And we have, we actually, you know, this, this stuff. Sorry? That's not a bad answer. Yeah. This stuff. I mean, we, don't, we didn't write it by hand. It's actually automatically generated. And, and the source files to parse the command line is also automatically generated. So we actually have a, 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 a code generator which, which works exactly the same. We haven't tried to in the cross-compilation setup, but I mean, it, it will just work. Cool? OK. Operations, OK, let's talk about this a bit. Um, so build system re really needs to, uh, handles just, well, I, I guess I'll have to change that as well. Um, build system re really handles just, uh, you know, making sure up to date, things up to date these days. So we have configure, we'll update installation, test, uh, prepare, preparation of distributions. All of you are familiar. So again, our little make file. This is how you, you normally will do it, right? You have these phony targets. And, um, some targets are, for example, test and install. They actually need to make sure that things that they are going to test or install are up to date. So this is how it's done. And when I first saw it, I, th I think everyone who, who sees it for the first time thinks, wow, this is like a really elegant way, right? It actually fits the model. Well, let's see if it actually does. So this is what you see quite a bit on the internet, usually pre prefixed with configure, make, make, install. So the question is, why is it make, install, and not just make, I mean, make, make, install, and not just make, install, right? We just saw it's actually going to up, update what, it go, what it's going to install. Well, there are two problems with it. Well, the first one is, let's say you have two targets, and you install both of them. So the first one gets updated and installed, and then once the make goes and tries to update, second one is a compile error. So you have this now half-broken install that you need to clean up somehow. The worst problem is that make install often t takes this form, right? Make sudo install. Imagine if, it, if, may, if this thing is actually going to you know, build stuff. It's going to generate our object files, executable files. All of them will be owned by root in your home directory. So it'll be fun to clean. Also, from the security perspective, it's, it's not an ideal thing, especially if some kind of third-party code generators running as root. So maybe targets are not the right answer for this. And kind of thought about it and decided, no, it's not. And we invented uh, operations. And what kind of the conceptual model is that we run operations on the dependency graph. So what you capture in your build files you know, is a dependency graph for your project. And then we run operations, update, clean, test, install. Now, what about configure? Uh, if you think about it, Configure doesn't feel quite the same. You, know, you don't really configure a dependency graph. What you do is you configure performing an operation in dependency graph. For example, you, know, you configure installing this dependency graph, and you specify installation directory. Or you configure building it, and you specify a compiler. So it, it seems that the configure is actually a, a operation on an operation on, on a dependency graph. And yeah, we call it a meta operation. Dist also turns out to be a meta operation. 
Um, again, you, do, you don't distribute a dependency graph. You distribute building a dependency graph, or you distribute installing a dependency graph. And for example, you might m not want to distribute testing a dependency graph. So that actually fits quite nicely. Um, then we kind of thought, well, while at it, we are going to add pre and post operations. So each op any operation in build can have a pre operation, which runs before it, and we have a post operation. And you know that I think you can guess how we solve that install and test um, problem. So we actually run update as a pre operation for test install. Uh, I'm going to skip it. So I'm not going to install lib hello, though it's quite fun. Let's talk about import a bit. So it's a generic mechanism uh, for kind of connecting projects together. And, and, and this kind of go going back to that code generation project, it kind of preserves all the kind of dependency checks. So if, if what you are importing is out of date, it's actually going to be brought up to date before you know you can you get to continue see what happens so this is a, a bit more kind of idiomatic example uh, how we use it so you can assign to the first one and you keep adding them and then use a prerequisite in the in your dependency declaration okay so how how does uh, what, what happens during this import search well the first one we've seen right we have this config import variable so it's checked if you specified where your project imported project is, that's where it's going to be. Then we have two interesting cases. We have the rule-specific search and a fallback search. Let's talk about a rule-specific search against our poor make file. Um, make actually has this rudimentary import support, right? It tries to mimic this dash L option of the compiler. Where do you think this library will be searched for? Well, in new make, it's, it's a bunch of kind of hard-coded paths, you know, USR local, USR lib. And that's not always the right way to search it. So then the next question, where should it be searched? And the answer is that it should probably search in the same place where the compiler would, right? We are mimicking kind of that functionality. And you know, it's, it's not actually easy to predict where the compiler will search for things. Should the compiler really search for it? Because the build system knows where it is, right? Um, so the comment was, should, should the compiler really search for it because the build system uh, knows? Well, we are in the case, you know, we didn't specify um, this variable. So the build system doesn't know. It's kind of trying to find it. So if you didn't specify a project, it, it, tr it tries to find, you know, in some... Once, even once it finds it, it can tell the compiler where it is. Yeah. Exactly. So you will see, I think I'll answer your question. So we actually need to search where the compiler will, would search it. And well, make should search there. And it's, it's, it's hard to guess where it will be. But luckily, you can actually ask the compiler where it searches. So it can extract the search paths. So what rule-specific search means, really, is that build2, if it cannot find the import via the variable that you specify in config uh, on the command line, it goes, it basically leaves the, the import kind of task to the rule that will build this target. So in our case, it will be uh, the C++ link rule. So what C++ link rule does, it actually asks the compiler that it's going to use for linking. Where do you search for libraries? You know, what's the system installation directories? And then it searches for that library in there and gives it to the compiler. So that's what the rule-specific search means. And then um, we have the, what's the fallback search could be. So if, if this d doesn't pan out, then currently just an error, but it's actually a third stage, which the idea is that we'll make it pluggable, so you can actually plug something in it. And the idea is that, for example, you can ask the, the distribution package manager to go and install something for you. So that's the idea. We also use, we're going to use this fallback search in, our, in the package manager. I'll talk about that in a second. We also have, so sometimes you want to uh, kind of compose your project out of many projects, and Best example is to get rid of dependencies. You don't, you don't want your users to go and you know, grab 10 different things. Actually, use it ourselves that we have an, uh, this composed kind of amalgamation of, for the build to tool chain. So you can go and get the package manager and the build system and all the prerequisite libraries in a single package. So we have proper support for that. And all you have to do is really just drop one into another. And the inner one becomes a sub-project, and the outer one becomes an amalgamation. Once you do that, 
uh, two things happen. Well, the, um, the subproject starts inheriting configuration from the amalgamation. So it will, for example, if you configured Clang in the amalgamation, that's what you're going to get by default, but you can always override it. So you can actually tweak the configuration of a, of a subproject. Uh, the second change in the import search, remember I showed you these three steps. Well, actually, I lied. There's a fourth one, and that's a search for, the in, for a sub-project. So basically, if you bundled something with your project, that's, that's the first thing that will be looked up at. So this is all works kind of automatically. Um, so here we kind of examine how we make lib hello a sub-project of hello. So remember we... We, there was this discussion about exactly is the BPKG configuration. Well, actually, it's amalgamation. If you think about it, you, you know, if you want to try and make a pa write a package manager, you'll probably imagine there's a lot of code that that will m make sure that packages configured the same way that they connected with each other. You know, that they know where where they they live. Well, in BPKG, there's very little code for that, and the reason for that is that it's just taken care by the build system. So packages automatically inherit the configuration from the amalgamation. And packages, you know, they resolve the dependencies because of that import stage. So a, a BPKG configuration is actually this on-the-fly created project, a build-to project, where we download packages. So it kind of amalgamates them. And because of that, the build system kind of does all the hard work for us. So maybe I'll just show you actually this one. I'm not going to skip this one. So remember, this is what this is our package configuration directory, right? So if we take a look at it, what's inside, we'll actually see this part, which which is looks very similar to let's say a hello example, right? We have the build file in this, and then we have a build subdirectory with bootstrap and root. And what you see at the further down is actually actual package subdirectories, right? Something that you would, I mean, there's not there's nothing magical going in in there. And if we look at this configuration file, right? So it looks exact. It's, it's actually the same file that we've created that when we configured hello example. Yeah. And, and notice that this this is the GCC five and O three optimization option that we used that we passed when we called BPKG create. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. How much time do I have? I mean, it's okay, perfect. So th this is kind of build system. I skipped a lot of actual terminal examples where I'm going to show how everything works, unfortunately. So let me also mention a couple of things about the rest of the tool chain. So it uses SQLite via ODB to store the package information. Um, one interesting problem that we kind of, well, it's implemented, but it was quite um, kind of out of our field is you know, what happens when someone breaks into a machine that, that hosts your repository? You know, we don't th think in terms of if that happens, what happens? We, 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 we think in terms of when that happens, what happens? <laughs> and, and the idea is that you sign a repository and you do it on a machine, on an offline machine. So you actually keep your private key on a, on a, on a machine that is not accessible from the internet. And the idea is that if, if, if even if someone breaks into into the repository, kind of the, the scenario, the nightmare scenario, is some someone breaks into the into your box, you know, backdoors a package, re, you know, up, up puts it into the repository, and then all your users are actually getting that backdoor package. So that that's that's kind of a nightmare scenario. And the idea is that if you sign this repository and you do it offline, even if someone breaks into the into your into your machine. Actually, you know, backdooring and replacing a package is not going to work because you know you, you, you won't be able to resign things. But CPP get we actually want to go a step further, and I don't know any of you used UB keys. No, nobody heard of them. So it's basically a USB device. You copy a key in it, but you cannot extract it. So it's kind of a one way thing. And what it does, the only thing you can do with the key is ask this device to sign you something. 
and also has a button, a physical button. So every, you can configure it so that every time you actually ask it to sign something, you actually need to physically press the button to kind of confirm that you allow it to do. So that's what we are planning to use. Oh, there is one. Cool. <laughs> so that's what they're actually planning to use for signing packages. So we'll have an extra kind of level of, of security. Cool. Um, so a couple of things that are still left in the package manager. Package manager is actually fairly complete and fairly simple because and, you know most of the heavy lifting is done by the build system. Uh, so we have to handle requirements. You know, you ask what the requirements are. These are what they are. So you, when you have a, a, pack, uh, a library that you depend on, you depend on. It's kind of simple. But what about things like C++ 11? You know, I require C++ 11, or I don't support Windows. So we call them requirements. Currently, you can capture them, but they're just purely for documentation. Uh, you know, the idea is that in the future we might have a predefined set of them that we enforce. You can always enforce them in the build file level, but it's kind of a bit too late. You would want to do it early, you know, the pack, you know, when you ask the package to actually fetch you stuff. So that's one thing that is still kind of needs to be taken care of. The other one is how to handle conditional runtime dependencies. You know, sometimes, well, in our case, for example, we always depend on leap hello. That's kind of a required functionality. But you also might depend on a library sometimes, you know, for example, you only need it if, if certain feature is asked by, by, the, by the user for, or you have a you know, broken compiler that you need to compensate for. So these are actually quite tricky because the package manager actually doesn't know whether the package needs it or not. So the idea is that it will assume it, the package doesn't need it and go ahead and try to configure it. And then it will intercept that fallback uh, stage in the import uh, search part, remember? So if this package is not found, then the, the package manager actually kind of gets notified of that. And it will go ahead, it will detect the situation, it will go ahead, kind of abort the configuration stage, go ahead, get that package, and kind of repeat this, the whole thing. So that's the plan right now. Sounds a bit hairy, but couldn't think of anything better yet. OK, uh, repository web interface. It's an Apache 2 module written in C++ 11. Did, was there a question? Yeah. Um, Sorry. How are you solving for dependencies? It's actually fairly straightforward. It doesn't backtrack or tries things. So it basically tries a forward thing, you know, get the latest, um, get all the latest packages. If that doesn't pan out, it kind of gives up and allows you to, override, to kind of resolve it. Gives you nice diagnostics. Which I think will, you know, practically handle probably bulk of the cases. So we didn't make the kind of complete uh, solver a priority for this project. Okay, so Apache 2 module uses Postgres. Um, one thing that we kind of focused on is that the package search actually does the right thing. I think that's kind of the mo will be the most useful thing. The, the most useful feature of it. And if you go to places like Debian package repository, I mean, they're just bad. You know, the search is just bad. Um, CPP get org. So we have, we have five sections in it. So each repository can have kind of uh, a subsection. So we have this stable testing beta alpha and Q. Uh, Q is just a volatile kind of staging area where you just we upload packages just to smoke test them. There's no guarantee about how long they will be there. Uh -huh. Question? What happens if I'm building and I don't have an internet connection? Uh, if you have the package or if you have a mirrored repository on the file system, you can use that. Otherwise, I mean, what other? You just need to get internet somehow. <laughs> but I mean, you can mirror. You can. You, if you have, you can actually. You know, getting a package from the repository is kind of a high-level functionality, but it can also tell PPKG, hey, the package is that file, use it. Or you can say the repository is in that directory, use it. So there's no, like, offline mode or... Well, Unless you provision for it. Once you build the dependency, you can be offline. Yeah. Because it's then a subproject and yeah, yeah. it behaves like you just wrote it. You only need internet if you're using a remote repository, so an, a URL repository. And you actually, you know, building a package that is already not in your configuration. 
Okay, so the kind of, I think you can guess how the packages transition through this stuff, right? Start in alpha, beta testing stable. Uh, the first four are tracked in the Git repository, so we store them in the Git repository. And the nice thing about it, you can you, you see a history of how where packages are added, removed, and how they moved from section to section. So this is all public. Uh, the, the Git repository is public. Things that we still need to kind of sort out is uh, our policies, you know, licenses. Well, for licenses, we said you know any open source li uh, license goes. Um, but things like name disputes, micro packages. I'm sure most of you heard of that NPM fi fiasco a couple of what months ago. And it's actually interesting uh, question. You know, I think kind of having a package for padding a string is a bit pushing it. But the, but a small packages, I think, is is a good idea. Like the other day, I was I needed a SHA-256, you know, uh, hash sum support, and there's nothing in the standard, of course. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna write mine. It's a small little utility, and I thought, you know, I could probably, I could go all the way from, you know, nothing to implementing it, providing a test, documenting it properly, and packaging it, and probably in one day. So you can actually get, get if you have this small, small little chunks, they're actually a lot more manageable to, to handle. You know, if you, if you have this massive collection of libraries, and you think, oh, okay, now I need to go ahead and document it, it's like a daunting task. So maybe this is what Boost 2.0 should look like, you know, that everyone is talking about. Yeah, <laughs> question. Uh, I don't know whether you've thought of this, but, but especially in my current job, it's become a major issue for me. There's lots of open source software I could potentially use for my development, mm -hmm. but I can't use any GPL3 software. Yeah, and actually, I thought about it. Most yeah. package mm -hmm. managers don't give me any way to say, you know, yeah. Don't show me anything that's going to depend yeah. on that. Actually, well, we thought, you know, it's all MIT, so, you know, it's basically free. So how, uh, are we going to make money from it or not, not make money for it? So one idea is that you can actually set, uh, probably create, you know, an enterprise version of the package manager, which could even be on open source, I don't know, where it, allow, it adds this extra functionality. For example, you can say, you know, GPL is off limits. You know, don't even show me that's packages. So that's kind of the idea. But I mean, we capture this information in the in the package description. So uh, a, lot we of, uh, a lot of systems capture all that information mm. and then don't yeah. need anybody to use it. Yeah. <laughs> really frustrating. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe we'll just add it. Cool. Just to echo that, a, a number of our clients are the same thing. Mm. There are certain licenses that we are allowed to use in mm. particular. We're allowed to just use anything. And then beyond that, we have to get legal approval for right. by package if it falls mm. out of that. Yeah, I think it is kind of two levels. It's for you personally, you're kind of enforcing it. But I think an organization might actually want to enforce it organization wide. You know, they say, OK, you use this version of the package manager, and it will, it will automatically enforce the licenses that we, we allow. So it's kind of, I mean, it, it did cross my mind. Uh, the other tool that is coming is the build bot. So now that we have a, you know, a sane, presumably, I don't know if you guys agree, a build system <laughs> underneath. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's not only package manager that becomes relatively easy. It's actually a, a build bot that, that we can implement as well. And the idea is that it will kind of push the changes to, to uh, BRIP, the repository interface. So, on this page, you will be able to see, OK, this package built successfully on these platforms, these compilers, and you know, failed here and here. And you can go see an error message. So that's kind of the idea currently. Um, talking about what's next, so Visual Studio and Windows support is coming. Well, s s some of you might have seen the lightning talk yesterday where uh, you saw kind of a little bit of that work and documentation. The package manager is is fairly well documented uh, because you know there's nothing really tricky in about it. Uh, build system is not documented very well. There's an introduction that shows how things go, but there's still kind of some design decisions are in flux. So we we don't to kind of commit to them before we sort it out. But I think it's going to happen soon. Parallel builds uh, still we want we kind of we don't want to go this standard model that we run 
things and then kind of launch the processes. We actually want to see if we can do it better, maybe make the actual build system multi-threaded. And you would think, well, there's not much to do, but there is actually stuff to do. For example, a good example would be parsing the header dependencies and kind of, I mean, there's quite a lot of them. You need to verify them, I mean, get the timestamps and so on. So we're still going to think about it. Um, some more, the other thing is, so these are kind of big things, there's quite a lot of little things. External modules and inline C++ uh, receipts. So we're not going to have any sh any shell because there's no shell on Windows. So anything that you want to kind of use custom code, it'll just be done via C++ 11, probably. All right, that's it. Questions? <laughs> uh, that's, I think we're going to have to cut off the recording because uh, uh, we have a break now. So okay. If anyone needs to leave, just uh, let's give a round of applause before we 